a legitimate question. Ask yourself this. Well, I'm going to, I'm not, you're not going to ask yourself this. I'm going to ask you it. Would the U.S. government in their infinite wisdom ever say on a project they've been working on for years and it has been proven to them to be ineffective, but it's an effective concept. It just, the mechanics need to work out and they just need more time to cook on it. But they said, no, screw it. We ball and send it out anyways, just for clout. If you're really surprised, I'm going to say yes. You need to read a history book. I'm not even joking. They've done this several times, but today we're specifically going over the M26 Pershing. Hi, I'm Ethan, and welcome to the Think Bunker. Now, the story of the M26 Pershing doesn't really start with the M26 itself as a standalone or even the predecessor series of vehicles known as the T-20, which includes the T-20, T-22, the T-23, T-25, and the T-26 that would become the Pershing. It rather starts with the structural flaw of the M4, specifically its height. Now, it's been said before that the M4 was so tall because, well, it looks like a German Panzer, but made in America, which... No, not, I, I, that's not true. It's because the engine's so tall. The engine used in the M4 is the R975C1 radial piston engine, which, if you look at it, that's an aircraft engine. It's the same one seen service in the B-18 bomber, which was America's replacement bomber for the B-17 because it crashed and killed the test pilots and then on the second flight, and then they replaced it with the Douglas design, but it was so poor in just everything. That they just took the they gave the the Boeing design another chance, and the B seventeen was essentially readopted. Uh, I can go over that in a B seventeen video, in a B seventeen focused video. I I will do that. But if you want to see that sooner than I planned for, let me know. Anyways, so the engine was the engine made the vehicle pretty tall because for one, radial engines are just tall. But two, it's an aircraft engine. That middle point there is where the propeller goes, and instead you've attached a drive shaft to it. This then goes down into where the transmission goes, so that means you have to, you know, kind of lift up the turret basket in your vehicle because, you know, and the U.S. was not going to get rid of their turret baskets because, unlike the communists, we like it when our loaders actually still have their feet after the gunner traverses the turret 10 degrees. Anyways, and also the transmission was also tall. It was a, it was a massive a, a robust synchromesh transmission, which had one reverse gear of nine miles an hour. Not great. So, with that in mind, the T20 does things to fix the M4 structural flaws. Again, being the location of the transmission, the awful reverse gear, and the height of the vehicle. And you can clearly see that. The vehicle is armed with an M7 76mm cannon, which are effectively... 3-inch auxiliary naval armament guns that had been cut and placed into a vehicle. This turret was rejected, and this whole setup was rejected on the gun part because they tried this previously with the M176, this thing here, and it didn't turn out so well. The M7 cannon would be used on several vehicles, such as the M176, the T20, the, I think it was the T23 as well, the T, yeah, the T23, the M4A176, the M6 Heavy, and did I already mention the M10 Tank Destroyer? The M10 tank destroyer, and before they moved into the M the M1A1 and then the M1A2, but that's a whole. I can I'll do that more in depth into the M4 video itself. From there, the engine was the Ford, if I'm not mistaken. Let me check my notes here. The Ford GAN. The GAN was a direct predecessor or the lineage starter of the Ford GAA and the Ford GAF. GAF. If you know engines, the Ford GAA was the engine used in the M4A3, and the 4GAF was the one used in the T25 and the, M the T26E3 Pershing, or later M26. So this is where the VA gets to start. The engine was awfully unreliable. Well, I wouldn't say awfully. It was somewhat unreliable, and the transmission was an all-electric transmission, similar to the one used in the M6 Heavy. In fact, this transmission was taken from the M6 Heavy, shrunken down, and put into the T20. And like the M6 Heavy, the transmission had a lot of issues. 
the transmission had a lot of benefits. And in fact, Ordnance Department really liked the idea of this transmission for good reason. The transmission is amazing, and I can get I I went into that a little bit later when I talked about the yeah, screw it. The transmission has a great reverse gear, and in fact, can reverse at the same speed and acceleration of which you can go forward. Apart from aerodynamic reasons. But other than that, it's pretty much one to one. Look at the Ferdinand. The German Ferdinand with its electric all electric system, that it's reverse and forward is the same speed. So pretty cool benefits. And also it accelerates very quickly. It accelerates and it yeah, it just accelerates very quickly. But the thing is this transmission was just awfully unreliable. Which is unfortunate, but it we can't service anything that's too unreliable, said AGF, but Ordnance Department was ambitious and I don't I don't fault them for being ambitious, but I just don't like some of the reactions when it came to implementing said result of ambition, but I'll get into that later. The T20 used the the, the same suspension as the M4, the the uh, horizontal bogey coil spring suspension that was quickly traded out for the VVSS when the US had the chance to. And also crew compartment space for the turret crew was cramped. That's why the turret was rejected, because the M176, same thing, was rejected because it was too cramped for the crew inside. Which, if that is too cramped, I really feel bad for the crews inside the Firefly. Uh, clearly, crew ergonomics were not part of the design when it came to this thing. I mean, seriously, we have T23 turrets. Allow, we can, I don't know why we, the British didn't ask us for T23 turrets to replace the, and just mount the 17-pounder in there. It would have been a lot more comparable than that. So it's, the, you know, you know the meme where it's, it's where you stick the gun, you rotate the gun 90 degrees and stick it in there. It's like, it's, it's retarded, but yet here we are. Anyways, that's the T20. The T20 would be canceled and in exchange, the T23 would take its place. Now, there was a T22 that existed, but it was just a modified T20, so it's not really worth talking about. The T23 was addressing the criticisms mostly of the T20 ser of the T20 beginner vehicle. The T23 housed a bigger turret. The way they did this was they moved the radio back a little bit and created a bit of a bustle and counterweight. Another way they did this was if you look at M4 turrets at the time, the turret would go flat up and then curve to the top. But instead, this one more so kind of bows out a little bit. So this way they can keep the same 69 inch diameter turret rings that they've been producing medium tanks with because to expand the turret ring by a couple of inches would throw off your logistical production. And the US production, although was very strong at this point, much more than it would be in the thirties, it's not massive as of now. So this is a way you can get more space in the vehicle. So your commander, could kind of like lean back in the turret a little bit more. So you have more room away from the gun. So good. AGF signs off on it. The suspension type was bogey. was moved from the bogey suspension seen on, on the T20 and on the M4 where they use coil springs where at a certain point they just hit each other like normal springs and they have a limited compression range. It was equipped with VVSS suspension, which was vertical volute springs where instead of being coil springs and they'd hit each or bogey spring and hit each other they were sheets of metal that you rolled and they would overlap so instead of hitting each other they would slide past each other in the same size package it would greatly expand the range and motion of the of the suspension arms and how far they could move and then the final upgrade, or at least the final addition to the vehicle, was a change in the engine from the 4GAN to the 4GAP, which, when I say this is the direct predecessor or the direct, yeah, direct predecessor to the 4GAA, this is it. This engine they effectively took out of the, actually, hold on, I'll get to that in a second. This vehicle was rejected simply because the transmission was still too unreliable, because just honestly, technologically, we were not there yet. No, no one was there to make a fully electric transmission that actually worked effectively. The electric transmission, the reason why it was being sought after so much, was because the vehicle could reverse at the same speed it could go forward. But again, just too unreliable at the time. It, it, the idea of the M26 is great. It's just they could, they could not get it down. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. The whole issue with the M26 and its idea. 
Um, I can get into that later. Anyways, this vehicle was the most important vehicle as far as the development of the M4, the M4 Sherman would go. And how can that be? Well, the turret off the T23 was dubbed the T23 turret, taken off. It has the same turret ring diameter as an M4, 69 inch diameter. So they just put it on an M4 chassis, modified the turret basket. This was known as the M4E6, which it doesn't stand for experimental six, but it's an experimental type of equipment, E. The E is like an addition, but not adopted. And this would become the 76 millimeter variant of the, of the M4. The T20, T23 turret was modified. Three type turrets were built and then sent out for each Sherman variant. The, those being the M4A1, the M4A2, and the M4A3. Funnily enough, the the standard model M4 they wanted, the M4, never received a 76 millimeter turret variant. Interesting. Anyways, moving on. The engine, like I said, was moved to the M4A3. The suspension showed up on the M4 around the time, the same time. Just the transmission didn't. They effectively took the parts off the T23 that could work and they put them on the M4. It's hey, that vehicle's not going to use it. It got canceled. So let's put it on the M4, and that's what they did. Which then leads us, which the Ordnance Department did what they did with the T20. They took the idea, the criticism, and just, they have to do them better now. Now there's no point in adopting the T23 when the only thing to fix is the transmission, because everything else from the T23 has been put on the M4. We got to go bigger. And I'm like, bigger. And so, this would lead to the development of the T25. So, as I stated previously, now you have to upgrade parts of the T23 in order to make it more viable. This would create and result in the T24, the T23E4 that would be renamed the T25, where they took a T23 turret, made it bigger, put the M3 90mm gun inside of it. They also upgraded the engine from the 4GAP to the 4GAF, which would be the direct, which would be the engine used in the M26 Pershing. And the suspension type, in the T23E3, they tested HVSS suspension, which was then modified and then adopted on the M4 later on in the war. It, was, it happened much later because the HVSS suspension was not looked at with a lot of importance because the VVSS was just fine. But then they started realizing that ground pressure issues were starting to be an issue because the vertical springs would push down into the ground and the m4 had to have narrow tracks because of shipping reasons they remedied the remedy this issue by putting duck bills where they slap on little extensions to the track but those fell off pretty frequently so hvss was developed or taken from the t23 which widened the track a little bit and at this point you had roll off ships so it really didn't matter then there's the then the e4 which would become the t25 used the torsion bar suspension the M4 did experiment with torsion bars, but at that point, it's just not worth it. It's just not worth to put torsion bars, because if you're going to do that, just adopt, adopt the T25 at that point. The T25 would also have an unreliable transmission, we know this, but had a minimum ammunition requirement or maximum ammunition count of 50 rounds. That's not acceptable to AGF. AGF had a minimum ammunition requirement, uh, I want to say it was 64 rounds, 65 rounds of, or 67, I think it was 67 rounds of ammunition, which, um, you know, the M4 just decided to put 97. The T25 would not, that would not fly. And from there, they would develop the, a larger turret, which would become the M, the T26, which would become the M26. This turret could stow at maximum 62 rounds of ammunition which would not fly with agf until it did one thing they cut the stabilizer yes i've been holding this back from you the t20 the t25 the t23 the t22 heck even the m6 heavy had a stabilized gun but it was cut because of minimum ammunition requirements and for once ordnance department didn't mess up here well specifically with the the range the rangefinder the, the gun stabilizer, the gyroscopic stabilizer. This was a result of arming ground forces. For some reason, they're like, hmm, what's that? K 
can't have three extra rounds, scrap the stabilizer, obviously. So they had to do that to expand the ready rack for the minimum ammunition requirement. Because I'm pretty sure you ask any crew member, what would you rather have? More ammo, three extra rounds of ammo, or a stabilized gun. They're going with the stabilized gun. I don't know why Ordnance or, or AGF decided to do that, but Ordnance Department was absolutely in the right to say, no, keep the, the, the stabilizer in, but uh, what do we know, right? Anyways, that was the, that was the development of the T-26, which would, be, would become the M-26 Pershing. Although the M-26 Pershing wasn't adopted officially until later on in 1945, close to when the war ended, or at least America's campaign against Germany ended, the M-26 had already seen service in the form of the T-26E3 in what is known as Operation Zebra, and not the massive mine-sweeping operation happening at Okinawa. This is the ground war on the Western Front, obviously, because the Pershing's not going to see service in, in the jungles of the Philippines, because... They didn't even want the 76 millimeter Sherman over there. Why would they want the, why, why would they want the Pershing? The T26 E3, as I stated, was just the, the, the standard Pershing. Originally, it was designated as a heavy tank because the armor on the front was about 100 millimeters or so, but that's about the effectiveness of armor that the M4 had anyways. It was about 110 on the M4A3 with, without the uh, little slots for the crew. The T26 E5, I know I skipped the E4, I'm going to get to that in a second, it's a little more complicated than the E5. The E5 is just extra armor on the front of a Pershing, and so it's colloquially known as the Jumbo Pershing, because in reference to the Jumbo Sherman, the E2 Sherman, that had thicker frontal armor to stop 88mm flak rounds. If you know Tank Lore, you know about this. And then there's the T26 E5, known as the Super Pershing, which this is the equivalent to that, or at least the American equivalent. Possessing the Super 90, which was absolutely massive as you could tell, yeah, you see those little recoil springs on the top, on the top of the turret? That's not recoil springs, or a stabilizing mechanism. That's the elevation gears. A set of large springs and gears inside of the box on top because the gun breaks are so large, and they needed so much ammunition in the turret, they had to just move the fire control equipment, or the mechanisms at least, outside the vehicle. It was not wildly practical. In fact, you had to load this gun, the, the Super 90, like a howitzer. You had to take the, the shell, the, the, the head, put it into the gun, and then take the actual casing, and then put it into the gun because of how little room per size of round the turret there was in the turret. So... And the, the, the ammunition used in this vehicle was not modified ammunition. This was standard M ammunition you'd see on an M3. The, the heads were, it's just they were, had bigger cartridges. Similar to the WZ-30, I think it was like the 39, the 30, I want to say it's like the, the WZ-35, the Polish anti-tank rifle, where they took a 7.92 Mauser round that they were using, and they just lengthened the cartridge and use that as an anti tank rifle. It's similar to that, so that's this that's the super person. Now there is a very metal version of this that does exist. As I stated before, this is the super Pershing, not that. That is a modification where as you can see by this one there's no front plate. What they did with this was there's a lot of people who think this is the standard version. In fact in the game War Thunder this is the Super Pershing in game, and what they did was they took the front of a Panther, cut that off, and placed it on the Super per on the on the Pershing hull on the front of the per Super Pershing hull, and they said, to which you'd say, what part of the front? Both of them, both of them. Lit lit they just took the front of a Panther, the upper and lower plates, and they just put it on there. It made it a lot more effective at stopping rounds. Yeah. Your suspension didn't like it, so that that's the variance that saw combat. And this is this was in a desperate attempt by the ordnance department to prove their project had teeth. And it, of course, we know it does. It's just it needs to be cooked longer, but they undercooked it because they wanted clout. And the U.S. Uh, AGF eventually decided to sign off on the Pershing, anyways, because it's already in theater. People are already starting to like it because it's a it's a bigger vehicle that we have now. 
it's and it is an understandable on its basic construction a understandable leap forward in technology just there's a few bits of that that needs that need to get worked out and on this model of vehicle unfortunately never would be the m26 pershing was named after general john pershing of the u.s army who was an absolute chad during the first world war and what i mean by this is woodrow wilson was approached by Fr by Fr by the french by french he was approached by the french about using american troops as subsidy or substitutes to the french troops because the french troops didn't exactly like being sent into german machine gun nests constantly and used as human shields effectively and so woodrow wilson actually said yeah this is perfect it, it will unite the americans who are divided racially into a common enemy it's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. General John Pershing gets word of this, goes, absolutely not. You ain't, you are not doing that to my troops. So what he did was, if America, he said, if America's going to operate in theater, in country, they're going to operate as America. They're not going to operate under some officers that have completely different cultures to the American culture, even though the whole purpose, according to Woodrow Wilson, is to unite the troops the racially divided troops to fight a common enemy, and then you're going to put them under command of French officers. N no. And it's a good thing he didn't. And that's, and that's who the vehicle was named after. Again, absolute Chad, unfortunately. It, it, that's, he, he didn't get that good of a vehicle named after him. Now, though it was a very important leap forward in technology, so there's that. Similar to Sergeant York and the anti-air vehicle there, which was also very unfortunate. Sergeant York was crazy. If you've never heard the, the story of Sergeant York, look it up. I, I think it was a conscientious objector. Con I butchered that. Conscientious objector. Like I, like Desmond Doss. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, the Pershing. Uh, let me check my notes here. Yeah, bulk standard, armed with the M390 mil. Had a single 50 cal up top for the commander, or the commander, the troops on the deck for aircraft and for infantry out front and two thirty caliber machine guns as we've talked about before all right real quick guys i want to go ahead and write some wrongs and add some stuff that i forgot to add previously and i do not have the time to simply bring this stuff out and record edit cut that down and then re-record so let's go ahead and get into it the engine would overheat because of poor fan belts this kind of was an issue on the ford gaa on the m4 the sherman however the pershing had it worse because of the layout of the engine meaning that the fan belt i think it had something to do with how the other equipment was placed in the engine bay causing the fan belts to rub against them and would break apart that sort of thing and so as a result they would overheat uh poor ventilation the pershing had very bad ventilation but this was eventually fixed i believe in the interwar period between 1945 and 1950 a new ventilator was installed on the pershing that helped alleviate the gun fumes now the crews were only under threat when rapid firing the pershing from the previous model of ventilator so there's that the transmission as stated previously is the cross drive transmission and it would tend to oversteer and overcompensate due to well just being unreliable the brakes would also tend to fail the previous two Brake failing and oversteering was also a problem on the M46 Patton, which was just a M26 Pershing that had some adjustments done to it. The assistant driver, however, I will mention, has a immediate takeover feature as long as he's aware and it, as soon as he can react. If the driver is killed in the Pershing and in the Patton, the co-driver can immediately take over. In U.S. tanks, the bow gunner is known as, or officially known as, the co-driver. However, the co-driver in any other vehicle is just a bow gunner and maybe they have a radio or unless you're in an m10 and you have and you're just along for the ride at that point but in this sense you are actually a co-driver so if your driver is killed you could take over as the bow gunner and drive the vehicle due to duplicate controls on your side of the vehicle Another thing I forgot to mention is the fact that the Pershing does not have wet stowage or a turret basket. This was cut because of ammunition requirements or minimum ammunition requirements by AGF. As a result, the Pershing had a similar ammunition layout to a T-34 or really any vehicle that had floor stowage ammo where you walked on the lids of your ammunition stowage bins. However, unlike a T-34, the Pershing did not have gaps in between the stowage bins to where your foot could get caught and then as the turret traverses, your foot doesn't come with you. 
The M26 would also have a commander override for the turret, meaning that if the commander so wished to, he could hit a lever forward for left and backwards for right so he could traverse the turret, say, if he saw something that the gunner didn't so he could put him on target. The Pershing also had access to an auxiliary generator for the electric system so they could remain hauled down and undetectable by noise, but still power their electric traverse, the hydraulic motor pump, and the lights within the vehicle. Speaking of hydraulics, the Pershing had two forms of power turret traverse. The first was the electric motor. The second was a hydraulic pump. The Pershing also had a manual traverse feature similar to an M4, but unlike the M4, you don't need to manually jiggle the turret and take it out of gear in order to traverse the turret. You could just grab the handle, release the brake, and start traversing the turret with the hand crank. So, slight improvement there. Later in the video, I talk about the Cologne incident, of which where the Panther was engaged by an M26 Pershing and the Pershing killed it. Well, in the segment, I believed that the entire crew was awarded medals of honor because of the propaganda reasons by the Ordnance Department. However, I was mistaken. The tank commander and the gunner were put up for silver stars, but the gunner was refused his silver star either because of a fraternization charge or because the fact that the gunner fired technically without orders, as I mentioned in the video. But either way, the crew did not receive medals of honor. I, I do apologize for that mistake. I don't know where I got that from. It was some kind of an award, but the point still stands I'm trying to make in that segment is that the crew did something that regular tank crews would have done anyways and yet they receive high praise for it when they're just doing the normal job and don't get me wrong their service and their actions are honorable for sure however i guess a case could be made that the pershing is an experimental vehicle all but experimental at this point by the time operation lumberjack happens and they're taking an unproven piece of equipment and just relying on it to save their lives so I guess there is an argument there for them receiving some kind of an award, but the point is I'm trying to make the ordnance part was trying to propagandize the heck out of this Pershing. Oh, and by the way, the gunner did receive his silver star in the 70s. Now, before I end the editor's note segment, I have two vehicle variants I forgot to add to the main segment, so I'm just going to add them here. The first being the T26E2, which is an M26 Pershing. However, instead of a 90mm cannon in the turret mantlet, the turret is housing a 105mm cannon. This is the Pershing version of the M4105. Secondly, the M26 T99 is the Pershing version of the M4 Calliope. This vehicle is a standard Pershing, However, there have been four rocket racks of 11 rockets welded to either side of the turret, two per side. The formation is four rockets on top, four rockets on bottom, and three in the middle, making 11 per rack, with four racks making a total of 44 rockets. Furthermore, the rocket racks could be jettisoned by the crew at any time in case of fear of ammunition detonation, or they have simply expended all their ammunition and wish to no longer have the extra weight. Alright, thank you for bearing with me. Back to the video. Now that we have all that tank development and lore out of the way, let's talk about how effective the vehicle was. And we'll start with the Second World War. In the Second World War, the Pershing was not too uh, terribly effective because the logistics and everything else around the Pershing was not set up to handle it. There was, in fact, instances where, or a instance where a M26 was supposed to be sent across. I think I talked about this already, if I'm not mistaken but is where a M26 was supposed to be sent across a bridge to go aid the infantry across said bridge in some, you know, they need tank support. So the ordnance officer there sends the Pershing, but the army engineer stops him and says, you can't cross that bridge. Well, uh, buddy, I got orders. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm in charge here. When it comes to this, I have seniority or I have superiority here. You're not putting that vehicle across that bridge because that bridge is too unstable. And they had to argue about it all, the whole time while the infantry is still dealing with the threat they called the tank support for. They eventually end up sending the Shermans. In in the Second World War, there were the, the chieftain had talked about how there were only really three confirmed Tiger encounters. Once with Sherman, or they won, that was with Lieutenant Farron. Then there was with the once with a Pershing that lost because one, and then there was a Pershing that lost against the Tiger, which I'm going to get to that. And then the last time was with a bunch of anti-air guns that found a bunch of Tigers on a railroad, uh, railroad car, and then just proceeded to cock block the crew from getting into the tank and firing at them. 
The Pershing Fireball, that's his name, lost against the Tiger in the most ridiculous way possible. If this was War Thunder, this would be straight up RNG. Where the way this, the, the Pershing and the Tiger got into a tank duel and Fireball ended up catching around from the Tiger in its mantlet, which absolutely should not penetrate. But it did because it just by this big a hole that big maybe the size of my eye a little bigger the round ended up catching the sight glass on the pershing's mantlet and just shoved its way through that's the only reason why the, the, the pershing lost that encounter because rng was just not on the fireball side on this one fireball referring to the pershing of course and overall its service record in world war ii probably due to lack of exposure, was lackluster to begin with. And even during its time under Operation Zebra as the T-26E3, it wasn't that impressive and was not worth the developmental time and weight. Now, one would think that the Pershing would see service in Korea and would excel more than it did in the Second World War, but call the Pershing the show shot because the U.S. Ordnance Department did nothing with it and it performed about as the same. In fact, worse, because now, instead of fighting on the flat plains of France or Germany, you're flat, you're flatting, you're fighting in Korea. Which, if I were to describe Korea, it's effectively a mountain range that protruded off of China, and it's in the middle of the ocean. When I say the middle of the ocean, it's a peninsula, and the peninsula just made up of mountains. Yeah, it's a mountainous place, and therefore the automotive troubles of the M26 would be very apparent in this environment, and it would be more useful of the Pershing to be used as indirect fire support, which I'm not even joking when I say that. It was, it was, yeah, it was bad. Though technically the Pershing has a more successful service record than the M4, but that's for some other reasons. Um, it was so bad to the point that when the America built an entirely new vehicle, similar in chassis to the M26, it was a modified chassis, and this was known as the M46 Patton, which was America's first MBT, the equivalent to the Centurion. And the Army adopted the M46. When the M46 was adopted, the Marine Corps didn't need to get rid of their Pershings because all of a sudden they had a mass surplus of spare parts for the Pershing. I wonder why. But overall, it's the Pershing was just, again rushed for clout. That's the best way I could describe it because that's, that's pretty much exactly what happened. And it's very unfortunate to see that happen. The amount of wasted time and energy just for clout. Even though, again, like I said in the beginning of the video, if you just let it cook, this vehicle could have been good. But no, you had to say, we ball and now we're here. And that does it for Bunker Brief number 15, part 1 on the M26 Pershing. In this video, we went over the technical data, the technical aspects of the M26. It's R&D, it's effectiveness, it's features, good and bad. All that stuff. Part 2 will be out between Monday and Wednesday of next week, and it's about the Cologne Cathedral incident. We covered it before on the channel, but we've never gone in-depth to the information, especially about the myths surrounding such incident. But with that in mind, we do apologize for video delays because we live in the southeastern United States, and we did get hit by the storm. In fact, one of us still does not have internet, so it's, it's rough down here. But that aside... Thank you for watching the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. We enjoy when you do, and in fact, I wait with bated breath every time I see someone subscribe. It fills me with the utmost joy, and I am honored that you like our content enough to subscribe, so please go ahead and do so. Now, if you want to be involved in the production of a video, we have a schedule, but it's pretty loose. So if you want us to talk about a certain vehicle or piece of equipment, drop a comment, and we'll put it on the schedule. We'll see if we can fit it into our schedule, which we can, but we'll see if we can make a video out of it, and we absolutely will. But with that in mind, I've rambled on enough. As per usual, get back to work.